This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from opentuition.com. All right, this is the third and the final lecture on semi-variable costs. And in the last lecture, we looked at regression analysis. But uh, I did say the one problem is that we had assumed the relationship was basically linear, whereas it could turn out that it was actually a curve or something. And what we'd done was a complete waste of time. And don't worry, you wouldn't expect you to deal with a curved relationship. However, it would be nice to know, is the relationship reasonably linear or not? Uh, we could draw a graph like I showed you in two lectures earlier. Uh, but that would be wasting time. There is, in fact, a measure that will tell us how linear we are. And it's paragraph six in the notes. It's called the correlation coefficient or Pearson's correlation coefficient. Uh, Mr. Pearson was the person who came up with it. Um, where we work out a figure, this coefficient. And then that will tell us how linear things are. Now, we'll interpret the figure after. But first of all, let's calculate it. Uh, you are given the formula in the exam for R, this coefficient. And I've typed it in the notes, but you are given it. Uh, and it looks awful. It's N sigma X Y minus sigma X times sigma Y divided by the square root of uh, sigma N sigma X squared minus sigma X all squared times n sigma y squared minus sigma y all squared. Now it looks awful, uh, but in fact, and this is why I told you to keep the table from the last lecture, we already know most of the figures. We know that n is 7, the number of sets of observations. We've already calculated sigma xy, sigma x, sigma y, sigma x squared, sigma x, sigma y. The only new term in it is sigma y squared. So let's go back to our table and calculate sigma y squared. And then we can use the formula. And again, I think I said twice before in the previous lecture, don't panic about having to do a great huge example in one question. Uh, you won't. But any bit of this can be and will be asked. So make sure you can you know, do the whole example. You can do all of it. You can do any bit of it. Anyway, let's get sigma y squared. And then use the formula. So y squared, well, 40 squared is what? 1600. 65 squared. 4225. 45 squared. 2025, 80 squared, 6,400, 70 squared, 4,900, 50 squared, 2,500. So the total, 1,600 plus 4,225, 2,025, 26,550 sigma y squared. And incidentally, this is why I wrote 40 instead of 40,000. You get the right answer still, but 40,000 squared is going to be enormous. It'll be all over the place. However, now let's stick them in the formula. R equals N7 times sigma XY, 1870, minus sigma X28 times sigma Y420, divided by the square root of 7 sigma X squared, 140, oops, Uh, minus sigma x squared, 28, 7 sigma y squared, 9 sigma y all squared. Oh boy. 
Now, again, it's up to you to make sure you're efficient with your calculator. You know, the more efficient, the more you can use brackets, the faster you can be. However, again, for everybody's benefit, I'll do step by step. So the top 7 times 1870, 13090, minus 28 times 420, 11760, divided by the square root of 7 times 140, 980, minus 28 squared, 7, 8, 4, times 7 times 26, 5, 50, 1, 8, 5, 8, 50, minus 4, 20 squared, 1, 7, 6, 4, 100. So the top becomes 13, 0, 90, minus 11, 7, 60, 13, 30. Divided by the square root of 980 minus 784 times 185850 minus 176400. So we're almost there. It's 1330 over the square root of. Uh, one eight five two two hundred, which is thirteen thirty over square root one eight five two two six thirteen sixty one equals to two decimal places point nine eight. The exam will make it clear how many decimal places they want, refer it's 0 0.977 or 978. Uh, I'm going to leave it to two places. Uh, now one thing before we interpret that figure is the sign of it. This can, as I explained, it can be positive or negative and the sign is divided decided by the top bit of the equation. Here it was 13,000 minus 11,000, so it was plus 1330. And therefore the answer is plus 0.98. Now I know some of you will say, oh, the square root of something can be negative, positive or negative, irrelevant here. It's the top of the equation. And it is possible that that minus that is negative, and if it was negative, then your answer would be negative. Now you'll see why that matters shortly, but be careful. I'm sorry repeating, but in ours, 13 minus 11 was plus 1330, and therefore R, the correlation coefficient, is plus 0.98. Uh, as to the interpretation of it, the value of R, it will always be between plus 1 and minus 1. You cannot end up with an answer of plus 1.8 or minus 2. It'll always be between plus one and minus one. If it isn't, you've made an arithmetic mistake. To interpret, if it's plus one, we say we've got perfect positive linear correlation. And what we mean by that, um, perfect linear correlation means that all our values lie exactly on a straight line. And positive means that the line goes upwards, that both go together. You know, for instance, here, we were looking at what? The cost as against the production. 
And so, of course, the more you produce, the more the total cost will be. And so you'd end up with a line going upwards, more production, more cost. And if it's plus one, it means it's perfect. Everything lies on exactly on a straight line. So the plus means they're going up together. One means they're perfect. Uh, the lower it is from one, the less perfect. So, you know, if it was plus 0 0.9, 0 0.9 plus, they'd still be going up together, but it wouldn't be exactly a line. At the other extreme, if it was minus one, it means we've got perfect negative linear correlation. Now again, perfect linear correlation would mean the points were exactly on a line, but the line sloped downwards. As one went up, the other went down. Uh, let me give you a little example. Suppose instead of the table giving you production and cost, higher production, higher cost, suppose I'd given you uh, <coughs> the price per unit, selling price per unit, and the demand. And what I'm getting at here uh, is quite often, I'm sure you're aware of it, but quite often the higher the price people charge per unit, the fewer they're going to sell. Lower price you sell more, higher price you sell fewer. So here, as the selling price went up, the demand would fall. So fine, I could have given you a table saying, selling price $20, sell $10,000, selling price $30, sell $5,000, and so on. Well, um, if they lay exactly on a straight line, uh, we'd have minus one, perfect negative correlation. Uh, if it was only minus 0.9, well, it would still be one goes up as the other goes down, but they wouldn't be exactly on a line. And so the nearer it is to plus or minus one, the better. The further it, or the nearer to zero, the worse. Zero would mean there was no correlation. It would mean they were just sort of all over the place. You know, there was just no link between the two. So that's how we interpret it. What did we get? We got plus 0.98. It's positive, so they are going up together, which makes sense anyway, we could see that. Higher production, higher cost. Uh, it's not one, so they don't lie exactly on a line, but you know, it's fairly close to one. And so they are reasonably linear. You can't actually set a, a limit on this. It depends how many you've looked at. Uh, but they are pretty linear. All right, that's virtually it. Uh, finally, though, one very minor little thing, but just to be safe. But it sounds similar, so make sure you learn the distinction. That is the cor uh, correlation coefficient. There's something else called the coefficient of determination. Now, you're not given a formula for this, but this is so easy to remember you don't need one. It's equal to the correlation coefficient squared. So for our example, 0.98 squared comes to 0.96. And this, in fact, is always positive. If you square a negative number, it's still positive. 
and what it means, well, read what I've written. It is a measure of how much of the variation in the dependent variable is explained by the variation in the independent variable. Ooh. Now here, remember, our cost depended on the production. As production gets higher, cost should get higher. As production gets lower, cost should get lower. If it was perfectly linear, then 100% of the changes in the output, we could predict the changes in the cost. Here, we say 0.96 or 96% of the changes in the cost are due to changes in production. So, there we are. All right, jolly good. Now we can leave semi-variable costs.